Hello, this is The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, of which I'll be call recording Chapter 14, The Triumph of the Witch. As soon as the witch had gone, Aslan said, we must move from this place at once. It will be wanted for other purposes. We shall encamp tonight at the fords of Baruna. Of course, everyone was dying to ask him how he had arranged matters with the witch, but his face was stern and everyone's ears were still ringing with the sound of his roar, and so nobody dared. After a meal, which was taken in the open air on the hilltop, for the sun had got strong by now and dried the grass, they were busy for a while taking the pavilion down and packing things up. Before two o'clock they were on the march and set off in a north-easterly direction, walking at an easy pace, for they had not far to go. During the first part of the journey, Aslan explained to Peter his plan of campaign. As soon as she has finished her business in these parts, he said, the witch and her crew will almost certainly fall back to her house and prepare for a siege. You may or may not be able to cut her off and prevent her from reaching it. He then went on to outline two plans of battle, one for fighting the witch and her people in the wood and another for assaulting her castle. And all the time he was advising Peter on how to conduct the operations, saying things like, you must put your centaurs in such and such a place. Or, you must post scouts to see that she doesn't do so and so. To that last, Peter said, But you will be there yourself, Aslan. I can give you no promise of that, answered the lion. And he continued giving Peter his instructions. For the last part of the journey, it was Susan and Lucy who saw most of him. He did not talk very much and seemed to them to be sad. It was still afternoon when they came down to a place where the river valley had widened out, and the river was broad and shallow. This was the fords of Baruna, and Aslan gave orders to halt on this side of the water. But Peter said, wouldn't it be better to camp on the far side for fear that she should try a night attack or, or anything? Aslan, who seemed to have been thinking about something else, roused himself with a shake of his magnificent mane and said, Eh? What's that? Peter said it all over again. No, said Aslan in a dull voice, as if it didn't matter. No, she will not make an attack tonight. And then he sighed deeply. But presently he added, all the same it was well thought of. That is how a soldier ought to think. But it doesn't really matter. So they proceeded to pitch their camp. Aslan's mood affected everyone that evening. Peter was feeling uncomfortable too at the idea of fighting the battle on his own. The news that Aslan might not be there had come as a great shock to him. Supper that evening was a quiet meal. Everyone felt how different it had been the previous night, or even that morning. It was as if the good times, having just begun, were already drawing to their end. This feeling affected Susan so much that she couldn't get to sleep. And when she went to bed, and after she, couldn't, she had lain counting sheep, and turning over and over, she heard Lucy give a long sigh and turn over just beside her in the darkness. Can't you sleep? get to sleep either, said Susan. No, said Lucy. I thought you were asleep. I say, Susan. What? I have a most horrible feeling as if something were hanging over us. Have you? Because as a matter of fact, so have I. Something about Aslan, said Lucy. Either some dreadful thing he is going to happen to him, or something dreadful that he is going to do. There's been something wrong with him all afternoon, said Susan. Lucy, what was that he said about not 
being with us at the battle. You don't think he could be stealing away and leaving us tonight, do you? Where is he now? said Lucy. Is he here in the pavilion? I don't think so. Thusa, let's go outside and have a look around. We might see him. All right, that's, said Susan. We might just as well be doing that as lying awake here. Very quietly, the two girls groped their way amongst the other sleepers and crept out of the tent. The moonlight was bright and everything was quite still except for the noise of the river chattering over the stones. Then Susan suddenly caught Lucy's arm and said, Look! On the far side of the camping ground, just where the trees began, they saw the lion slowly walking away from them into the woods. Without a word, they followed him. He led them up the steep slope of the river valley, and then slightly to the right, apparently by the very same route which they had used that afternoon in coming from the hill of the stone table. On and on he led them into the dark shadows and out into pale moonlight, getting their feet wet with the heavy dew. He looked somehow different from the as then they knew. His tail and his head hung low and he walked slowly as if he were very, very tired. Then, when they were crossing a wide open place where there were no shadows for them to hide in, he stopped and looked around. It was no good trying to run away, so they came towards him. When they were closer, he said, Oh, children, children, why are you following me? We can't sleep said Lucy, and then felt sure that she need say no more, and that Aslan knew all they had been thinking. Please may we come with you, wherever you're going, asked Susan. Well, said Aslan, and seemed to be thinking. Then he said, I should be glad of company tonight. Yes, you may come, if you will promise to stop when I tell you, and after that, leave me to go on alone. <coughs> oh, thank you, thank you, and we will, said the two girls. Forward they went again, and one of the girls walked on each side of the lion. But how slowly he walked, and his great royal head drooped so that his nose nearly touched the grass. Presently he stumbled and gave a low moan. Aslan, dear Aslan, said Lucy, what is wrong? Can't you tell us? Are you ill, dear Aslan? asked Susan. No, said Aslan, I am sad and lonely. Lay your hands on my mane so that I can feel that you are there and let us walk like that. And so the girls did what they would never have dared to do without his permission. But what they had longed to do ever since they first saw him, buried their cold hands in the beautiful sea of fur and stroked it, and, so doing, walked with him. Up the st <coughs> And presently they saw that they were going with him up the slope of the hill on which the stone table stood. They went up at the side where the trees came furthest up, and when they got to the last tree, it was one that had some bushes about it, Aslan stopped and said, Oh, children, children, here you must stop. And whatever happens, do not let yourselves be seen. Farewell. And both the girls cried bitterly, though they hardly knew why, and clung to the lion and kissed his mane and his nose and his paws and his great sad eyes. Then he turned from them and walked out on to the top of the hill. And Lucy and Susan, crouching in the bushes, looked after him, and this is what they saw. A great crowd of people were standing all round the stone table, and though the moon was shining, many of them carried torches which burned with evil-looking red flames and black smoke. But such people, ogres with monstrous teeth, and wolves, and bull-headed men, 
spirits of evil trees and poisonous plants, and other creatures whom I won't describe, because if I did, the grown-ups would probably not let you read this book. Crawls and hags and incubuses, wraiths, horrors, afrites, sprites, orkneys, wooses, and ettins. In fact, here were all those who were on the witch's side, and whom the wolf had summoned at her command. And right in the middle, standing by the table, was the witch herself. A howl and a gibber of dismay went up from the creatures when they first saw the great lion pacing towards them, and for a moment even the witch seemed to be struck with fear. Then she recovered herself and gave a wild, fierce laugh. The fool! she cried. The fool has come! Bind him fast! Lucy and Susan held their breaths, waiting for Aslan's roar and his spring upon his enemies. But it never came. Four hags, grinning and leering, yet also at first, hanging back and half afraid of what they had to do, had approached him. Bind him, I say, repeated the white witch. The hags made a dart at him and shrieked with triumph when they found that he had made no resistance at all. Then others, evil dwarves and apes, rushed in to help them, and between them they rolled the huge lion over on his back and tied all four paws together, shouting and cheering as if they had done something brave, though, had the lion chosen, one of those paws could have been the death of them all. But he made no noise. Even when the enemies straining and tugging pulled the cord so tight that they cut into his flesh. Then they began to drag him towards the stone table. Stop! said the witch. Let him first be shaved. Another roar of mean laughter went up from her followers as an ogre with a pair of shears came forward and squatted down by Aslan's head. Snip, snip, snip went the shears, and masses of curling gold began to fall to the ground. Then the ogre stood back, and the children watching from their hiding place could see the face of Aslan looking all small and different without its mane. The enemies also saw the difference. Why, he's only a great cat after all, cried one. Is that what we were afraid of? said another. And they surged around Aslan, jeering at him, saying things like, Puss! Puss! Poor pussy! And how many mice have you caught today, cat? And when he like a saucer of milk, pussums! Oh, how can they? said Lucy, tears streaming down her cheeks. The brutes, the brutes! For now the first chop was over, and the shorn face of Aslan looked to her braver and more beautiful, more patient than ever. Muzzle him, said the witch. And even now, as they worked about his face, putting on the muzzle, one bite from his jaws would have cost two or three of them their hands. But he never moved. And this seemed to enrage all that rabble. Everyone was at him now. Those who had been afraid to come near him, even after he was bound, began to find their courage. And for a few minutes, the two girls could not even see him. So thickly was he surrounded by the whole crowd of creatures, kicking him, hitting him, spitting on him, jeering at him. At last the rabble had had enough of this. They began to drag the bound and muzzled lion to the stone table, some pulling and some pushing. He was so huge that even when they got him there, it took all their efforts to hoist him onto the surface of it. And then there was more tying and tightening of cords. The cowards, the cowards, sobbed Susan. Are they still afraid of him even now? When once Aslan had been tied, and tied so that he was really a mass of cords on the flat stone, a hush fell on the crowd. Four hags, 
holding four torches, stood at the corners of the table. The witch bared her arms as she had bared them the previous night, when it had been Edmund instead of Aslan. Then she began to wet her knife. It looked to the children, when the gleam of the torchlight fell on it as if the knife were made of stone, not of steel, and it was of a strange and evil shape. At last she drew near. She stood by Aslan's head. Her face was working and twitching with passion, but his looked up at the sky, still quiet, neither angry nor afraid, but a little sad. Then, just before she gave the blow, she stooped down and said in a quivering voice, And now, who has won? Fool, did you think that by all this you would save the human traitor? Now I will kill you instead of him as our pact was, and so the deep magic will be appeased. But when you are dead... <laughs> What will prevent me from killing him as well? And who will take him out of my hand then? Understand that you have given me Narnia forever. You have lost your own life and you have not saved his. In that knowledge, despair and die. The children did not see the actual moment of the killing. They couldn't bear to look and had covered their eyes.